Is this thing working? Yeah, so what I want to cover is the story, taking a cue from Adrian. Now I want to tell a story. So um, it's about the origin of the concept of green belts and the relevance to a future potential for farming in the green belts as seen through the lens of the government's recent 25 year plan for the environment, a green future. Uh, I want to start with some of the people who invented the term green belt and why they felt compelled to do so and why this idea is still of good standing in the 21st century. I will move on to look at London's green belt particularly around the metropolis as this was where the idea started and currently where the greatest pressures for development are being experienced and exerting the most impact on the future of farming in the periphery of a market of 8.5 million hungry Londoners projected to grow to 10 million hungry Londoners in the mid-century. And I'll touch on why it seems to make absolute sense to continue growing food in the green belts and to briefly assess what other potentially marketable commodities and functions can accrue to farmers and landowners as we edge gingerly, as many speakers have said, towards a potential new post brexit system of land use subsidies of public money for public goods. And then finally, I will explore the government's new 25-year environment plan in terms of reinforced greenbelt protection and enhancement. This being the first time that protection and enhancement have been coupled together, although almost in an exploratory way, as this is open to further discourse and implementation. Uh, I hope that this latter element will provide us with some food for thought as well as food on our forks. Um, I've just written a book. Uh, this is the title of it, available in all good bookshops and um, hopefully downstairs eventually. Uh, and it was about really the story of the origins of green belts. Um, it's part of my research into the Hill family. Um, I needed to explore the influences and the motivations of this remarkable, truly remarkable Victorian era family. Most people will have heard of Octavia Hill, largely because she is celebrated as the co-founder of the National Trust and as a pioneer of social housing management. However, there were 11 other Hill siblings. Arthur Hill uh, was uh, one of just two brothers, the other died in infancy, and became mayor of Reading in 1883 to 87. And is still celebrated here in the town's other museum, um, where his greatest gift to the nation is still on display. This is the only full-size copy of the Bayer tapestry in the world, which Arthur, bless him, purchased for £300 as an educational offering for the people of Reading, his adopted town, during his period in office. It's still here. You can still go and see it for free. Another of the Hill siblings, Miranda, was described by her mother, Caroline, as being dreamy but might be regarded as the imaginative force behind much of the substance of events that changed the world of conservation. She later wrote books of fairy stories, but it was her inspirational visionary thinking that history has failed to give her due regard, I think. Most of her ideas were captured by her energetic and accountancy-minded sister, Octavia, who took pains to record and publicise everything of value. Octavia was good at seeing potential, and thoroughly capable of exploiting Sister Miranda's ideas and putting them to practical use. They made a formidable pairing. There were other family influences taken into account too. Their father James was from a wealthy corn merchant family in East Anglia that also owned a private bank. He was also a radical Owenite utopian, keen to improve social conditions in Wisbeach. He married three times. He was widowed twice before meeting Caroline Southwood Smith, the first woman to teach Pestalozian educational methods in England. This is an important point. They opened a school together. He suffered mental health problems when his bank failed, no safety net in those days, uh, in the 1840s, leaving Caroline to care for all the younger children. She was aided by her remarkable father, Dr Thomas Southwood Smith who was a pioneering leader of the sanitation movement, 
who recognised the links between poor sanitation, poverty and ill health. He also campaigned with Charles Dickens to end the appalling working conditions of children in mines and factories. Caroline and her children, including Miranda and Octavia, moved to Finchley, then in the countryside, where they played outdoors and even met, but were bored by Hans Christian Andersen. When her father retired, Caroline, now a Christian socialist Unitarian, needed paid, paid employment and moved the happy girls from their green rural idyll to the ghastly, smoky slums of Marylebone. Sorry, go back one. Oh, my slides disappeared. There it is. Uh, that, isn't, that isn't the ghastly, smoky slums of Marylebone, but um, it'll do. It was the shock of this forced transition that can be seen now as a spark for improvement in green spaces, slum housing, fresh air, places to walk and places to visit that has led to many of the institutions and designated landscapes that inform our modern world, including the green belts. The hills spent the rest of their lives making things better, partly as a Christian duty, but also because of their Pestalozian philosophy of head, heart and hands. Learning to think better things, being compassionate for others, and capable of doing practical tasks. There were other direct external influence on the hills to account for as well, such as John Ruskin, up here at the top, Henry Mayhew, over there, uh, F.D. Morris, down here, and uh, grandfather Southwood Smith at the top. And he introduced these girls to his influential circle of politicians and reformers. And even at an early age, they were capable of holding intellectual arguments with some of these national luminaries of their age. So they were very well advanced young children. So when Miranda invented something which we probably would scoff at today, the Society for the Diffusion of Beauty, to place objects of beauty within reach of the poor, that was its official objective, later to be renamed the Curl Society. It was Octavia who saw the greater value of this as a tool to increase the health and well-being of the London poor and managed to get the idea in front of the next meeting of the National Health Society. Not the National Health Service, the National Health Society. With a specific sense of opening up disused burial grounds so that poor people might have some place to sit and see green things. Octavia called these and similar places open-air living rooms. This is a later open-air living room. The housing you can see on the back is housing she built to house slum tenants. Uh, a workshop building here to hold meetings and to do practical things. So you can see the Pestalozian influences coming to bear in this one example in Southwark. This then became the model for garden villages, garden cities, and all the rest that we now enjoy through the planning process. They developed concepts of rights of air and exercise alongside a Coral Society drive for smoke abatement and smokeless fuels. They covered a wide spectrum. Miranda and Octavia are now on a mission and evolved a fourfold system to provide better living conditions. Number one, small open air living rooms, today's pocket parks. Two, supervised playgrounds for slum children, the first of which was paid for by John Ruskin, even though he didn't know it. Three, places to walk to and stroll in, today's green belts and four places to visit further away on uh, cheap day railway tickets, such as today's areas of outstanding natural beauty, echoing Miranda's poetic sense of beauty in the original name of the society. They drew in others, such as William Morris, to develop the decorative arts, and hopefully this will be Sir Robert Hunter, and people like Robert Hunter to press for the preservation of urban fringe commons and acquire for public health the land surrounding London. In this task, the Commons Preservation Society's lawyers, led by Robert Hunter, were immensely successful, saving not only Wandsworth, Wimbledon and Warpleson Commons from housing developers, but also Hampstead Heath, Burnham Beaches with the Kyle Society, 
and Epping Forest. Some of Octavia Hill's passion and fire was fueled by her greatest ever loss, the failure to save Swiss cottage fields, where she had played as a child from housing developers, despite raising the cash to buy it from uh, wealthy benefactors. From the moment she resolved to do better and surveyed the whole of London, this is her original survey map, and you can see these dotted lines and at the top, the parks and open spaces within six miles of Charing Cross. She discovered that for every acre of green space in the affluent west end of London, that acre was shared by 682 people. But in the poorer east end of London, every acre had to be shared by 7,481 people, an 11-fold difference. In forming an alliance with Robert Hunter, she wrote these poetic words, uh, which seem quite modern. We all need space. Unless we have it, we cannot reach that sense of quiet in which whispers of better things come to us gently. It still reaches out to modern audiences today, I think. So in an alliance with Robert Hunter, uh, she wrote a paper in 1883 called More Air for London which conveyed the sentiments he also shared. And gradually their thinking merged into a key paper written by Hunter, a suggestion for the better preservation of open spaces in 1884. And he quoted Octavia Hill's experience. This episode, the loss of Swiss cottage fields, however, and Miss Hill's eloquent advocacy of the needs of dwellers in crowded parts drew attention to the importance of rendering available for public use not only large open spaces like commons situated on the edge of cities, but every other scrap of greenery that can be found at the doors of the poor. Hunter went further. The central idea is that of a land company formed not for the promotion of thrift or the spread of political principles and not primarily for profit, but with a view to the public interest in the open spaces of the country. And thus the idea for the National Trust was formed. So, although it was not for another 12 years that it was incorporated, and when it was created, it steadily acquired land that formed Octavia's idea of a green belt for London in the Surrey Hills and Kent Downs, as well as the dotted urban fringe commons that remained safe from enclosure by a series of commons acts in the late Victorian era. The inspiration for it was derived from a crisis in public health and well-being. In that sense, it shares some of the same factors with today's crisis in health and well-being. Although the air pollution is different and obesity has replaced malnutrition and lack of exercise has replaced hard labor people still need space to thrive in a civilized society. So Octavia Hill's fourfold observation could also read across to today's analytical data from the monitoring of engagement with the natural environment. And this simply shows that we're about as imaginative as voles leaving their holes. Most of us travel less than one mile to get our nature kick a few more go one or two miles to get it. 64% uh, of visits are taken on foot and most of them are within five miles of where we all live. So there is a really important geography emerging from this. In a highly urbanized society where the census records 81% of us living in cities and large towns with another 9% in rural towns, the urban fringes and green belts are this hugely important geography for all the reasons identified in Victorian times, but magnified by the subsequent expansion in population. The London Metropolitan Green Belt, our next piece. There are 14 green belts designated in England covering 1,637,000 hectares thereabouts. The largest is the Metropolitan Green Belt around London, and is over half a million hectares and serves not only London's future population of 10 million but also population of the towns within it and on its edges. 
It has a lot of these. You'll never be able to see any of that at the back, sorry. Uh, this is simply a density map of public rights of way. Uh, the darker the uh, tonation, uh, the more rights of way there are. Uh, this one, for the same reason, uh, darker tonation shows greater opportunities for priority habitats, uh, and the distribution around London is pretty good. Uh, the third one is something about the density of natural capital and recreation opportunities. And uh, this is derived from Dieter Helm's work on the Natural Capital Committee. Uh, so in natural capital, which I'm really pleased that all previous speakers have managed to do the heavy lifting on, on the, all these definitions and things, uh, much of this is obviously in the form of agricultural biomass, the fields and crops that give us food. Uh, but when given a value, natural capital is also capable of producing an index of relative values based on ecosystem services, principles derived from things that the environment provides, such as food, water to drink, air to breathe, timber, but also health and well-being services derived from recreation and wildlife. The Office for National Statistics has recently published a report showing that the value of our agricultural biomass is worth a whopping £100 billion but that recreation has a value of £300 billion. Uh, this might seem surprising, but is indeed a gross underestimate because it uses as a proxy only the value of paid admissions and fuel to get to recreation and attractions. It does not give a value to the majority of those visits within one to two miles that we saw on the slide, uh, where most people live and visit in the green belts and in the urban fringes. Here lies a massively untapped market potential for economic growth. London's metropolitan greenbelt, like its Victorian predecessor, is currently massively under threat from being turned into housing estates. The urban sprawl that its designation was designed to protect it from. CPRE studies have shown that there are currently over 200 planning applications for over 120,000 new houses in the metropolitan greenbelt alone. Other studies have shown that if built, these houses will generate an extra 2 million car movements in a London and South East road system that is already highly congested. Professor Dieter Helm, who also chairs the government's Natural Capital Committee, has developed a very cogent argument why green belts should be seen as a system of land use, a system of land use, and absolutely preserved. Sadly, there's insufficient time for me to expand on this in the presentation today, but it's worth looking up his reasoning. Uh, but suffice to say that once lost to development, they will be lost forever, and their essential soils and biomass will not be available to grow food or soak away rain or indeed give us any of the joy of seeing growing things, a part of our innate human biophilia. Uh, the importance of farming in the green belts. Well, all right, obviously market proximity, natural character areas, keeping it green, slow food. Nobody's talked about slow food yet. Uh, uh, an idea I woke up to yesterday on the plane from Finland, mm. uh, uh, grown in the Greenbelt quality food mark, perhaps, mm. uh, but certainly multi-purpose land use. So, um, aping Tony Blair, soil, soil, soils. It might be argued that historical invasions of England have taken place because of our superb soils, although other reasons may apply too. Uh, and the crops that others envied. So Spaniards, Italians, Danes, Swedes, Norwegians, Dutch, Germans, French, in various historical forms, um, have all had a nibble at our crops and potential, potential, soil potentiality over past millennia. The Anglo-Saxon Germans gave us the word field, and the Norman French listed all the agricultural loot down to the last piglet and sack of wheat. In the dimmer past, much of our forests and woodlands were felled to make growing spaces for crops, and the ironic legacy of this soil creation is that we're one of the least wooded countries in Europe, although the metropolitan green belt contains 18% woodland cover. The job of the farmer in caring for and coercing the best from this worm-rich material is difficult and time-consuming, as other speakers have said. However, it is essential to protect it properly. If you want to eat food grown from our own resources or close to where we live, soil exhaustion will haunt us. And very scary things have been said about the estimates about continuing soil fertility. The Thames Basin has rich alluvium soils, refreshed historically 
by cycles of silt-bearing floods. There's one going on right now. Reading was famous for beer, biscuits and bulbs, all products of this rich culture of alluvial soils. It's a living, breathing, permanent treasure. So why would anyone in their right mind want to cover it in concrete and tarmac? Some substantial areas of the metropolitan greenbelt is covered in good soils. There are also distinct characteristics derived from landform, geology, nature and land use that create natural character areas, as we've been discussing. And the 159 strong national character area classification system that Natural England has developed to help inform land use choices. There are six main ones in the Metropolitan Greenbelt and several others partly in it. Uh, from rich alluvium to chalk based woodlands like the Chilterns or Surrey Hills to poor sand and outwash gravels underlain Thames Basin Heath. Farming in the Metropolitan Greenbelt has always been seen as a huge market advantage, exploiting the proximity between grower and consumer. However, this has been disrupted by globalisation and transport albeit with the environmental impacts of these features being ignored and externalised. Excessive waste plastic being just one factor in this ignorance. Now that consumers are becoming aware of these planetary costs, perhaps local change will also occur. The house that I live in, in Twyford, a few miles from here, was built in 1914 to exploit these grade one soils at the very westward edge of the metropolitan greenbelt to grow glasshouse tomatoes and cucumbers for London and Bar Birmingham. These were shipped out daily by horse and cart and steam train. Next to it was an orchard, a really big orchard, with a unique apple called the John Waterer. But in the 1970s, the glasshouses became a housing estate and the orchard was grubbed out with fruit still on the trees to grow oilseed rape. We know the reasons why. With globalisation, we seem to have lost some of that special character of place and food that is kept alive in other countries, such as parts of France, Spain, Italy, Scandinavia and Germany, where the slow food movement, valuing local producers and their produce, is at its highest form. Ironically, perhaps, all being countries that have invaded us for our soils in the past. Do we need to reinvent the local food market and embrace slow food? The Countryside Agency uh, initiated the Eat the View scheme, and it is possible to rejuvenate this practice as a real connection between consumers and producers. It seems very few people want to eat chlorinated chicken. Any hands up? Anybody wants to eat chlorinated chicken? Uh, or hormone, tam hormone tampered beef from the USA or elsewhere. And would rather opt for the high quality and high animal welfare standards that can be achieved by local farming enterprises here. Could there be an offer to create a grown in the green belt mark? A green ring of local, local quality produce that consumers can also visit to see the source of their food, giving a green ring of confidence to allay fears amid secret trade deals and shifty marketing of items of dubious provenance. Establishing a green belt mark, combined with inviting the consumer onto the source of the food they consume, makes a virtuous circle. And the offer can be expanded to give both food and recreational enjoyment. As 90% of the population lives close to the rural urban fringes and green belts, it makes smart economic sense to exploit this multipurpose land use gift of proximity in as many diverse ways as possible, obviously without killing the goose that lays the golden egg. Right, finally, the 25 year environment plan. And it seems like finally, it seems to have been finally coming for uh, about two years. Uh, it's now here and the government launched a 25-year plan for the environment to green future in January 2018. Um, this is a quote from the Prime Minister, who's also our local MP. <clears throat> the environment is something personal to each of us. I think we've all established that today. But it also is something which collectively we hold in trust for the next generation. And we have a responsibility to protect and enhance it. That meme runs through the whole of the paper. So it follows on from earlier reports on the leadership of the Natural Capital Committee in holding the government to its promise to leave the environment in a better state than it inherited and the Secretary of State willing to commit to such a policy. So here you see the raft of papers that are kind of laid over the past half a decade to where we are now. Uh, each one important in their own rights as being a kind of building block on that journey. 
There are six, you won't see this at the back either. Uh, there are six sections to the report, uh, but basically we're talking about achieving clear air, clean and plentiful water, thriving plants and wildlife, reduced risk of harm for environmental hazards such as flooding and drought, using resources from nature more sustainably and efficiently, enhancing beauty, heritage and engagement with the natural environment. Uh, and then pressures about mitigating and managing climate change, minimizing waste, managing exposure to chemicals and enhancing biosecurity. So these are the six key areas. Uh, I'm not going to deal with four, five and six. Uh, number one, we've largely dealt with during the course of the day. Uh, so I'm just going to focus on recovering nature and enhancing the beauty of landscapes and connecting people with the environment to improve health and well-being as government policy. We've only got time to skin these. We'll do it. In connecting people for their better health and well-being, we can see that some of Miranda and Octavia Hill's Victorian ideas are coming full circle, particularly with plans emphasis on greening towns and cities, urban fringes, and helping children. Places will need to be found for environmental therapies, such as a threefold expansion of care farming, probably in the green belts and urban fringes, encouraging children to be close to nature in and out of school, for which a £10 million fund has been established by the Department of Education, and much of that use could be promoted in the green belts, uh, nearest to the selected most disadvantaged communities. The greening of towns and cities will necessarily include planting 11 million more trees in the rural urban fringes and green belts and 1 million in cities. This will include the idea launched by the PM of a great northern forest, linking Liverpool to Hull and embracing the massive 250,000 hectare northwest green belt and the equally large south and west Yorkshire green belts on both sides of the Pennines and provide a green backdrop to the much-touted northern powerhouse. If there is an appetite, too, for the creation of a great southern forest, a show of hands for that, please, um, perhaps linking wooded and less wooded parts of the metropolitan green belt, like the Chilterns and Surrey Hills, to the Thames Chase and Watling Chase community forests. There is much to note of green belts in the plan, with the government reinforcing its commitment to protecting the green belts, And it went further with a plan to enhance the green belts. An enhancement uh, is continued by um, the next slide. Leaving the cap means we can do much more after the, for the environment. After a period of stability, to ensure smooth transition, we will move to a system of paying farmers public money for public goods, which we've explored. The principal public good we want to invest in is environmental enhancement. These enhancements will need to take place on land that is currently has some other purpose, probably mainly farmland, and therefore the debate about choices, incentives and benefits will be ones requiring much thought and agreement added to which the concept of a nature recovery network, introduced some time ago by Sir John Lawton, but now proposed to include half a million hectares of previously undesignated nature landscapes. These are suggested as jigsaw pieces linking other established nature sites that might be as much as 25,000 hectares, roughly the size of Oxford or Cambridge Greenbelts, in their total extent. The plan seeks to... Final slides coming up. We want to look at establishing wildflower recovery areas. This would make it easy for people to visit flower-rich meadows, grasslands and heathlands close to their homes. This would be linked to existing green infrastructure to extend wildlife corridors into towns and cities and provide opportunities for conserving wildflowers and insect pollinators. These will also need to be debated and sought as land to be repurposed from current uses. And finally, if a weak is deemed to be a long time in politics, then the next 25 years looks to be a most interesting time in shaping the future food, health and well-being of the nation in the Greenbelt landscapes closest to where most people live, work 
and raise their families. Thank you for listening.